kids are testing us and they'll they'll tell you about a small misdeed to see how you react and then they'll tell you about the bad one so if you flip out over a bad grade you are never going to understand why there's a new dent in that car you're listening to the mindful mama podcast episode number 248 today we're talking about nurture shock with ashley merriman Welcome to the Mindful Mama podcast, now with over a million downloads. Here, it's about becoming a less irritable, more joyful parent. At Mindful Mama, we know that you cannot give what you do not have. And when you've calm and peace within, then you can give it to your children. I'm your host, Hunter Clark Fields, Mindful Mama mentor. I help smart, thoughtful parents stay calm so they can have strong, connected relationships with their children. I've been practicing mindfulness for over 20 years, I'm the creator of Mindful Parenting, and I'm the author of Raising Good Humans, a mindful guide to breaking the cycle of reactive parenting and raising kind, confident kids. Welcome back to the podcast, my friend. Did you hear that? Oh my goodness. We have over a million downloads now of the Mindful Mama podcast. So thank you. If you are a faithful listener and you've been sharing it with friends, thank you. Thank you. This is so cool. I'm like super all butterfly inside. It's so exciting. And of course, welcome. If you are a new person, this is an amazing episode to listen to. Ashley Merriman is amazing. So with Poe Bronson, she is the author of the New York Times best-selling book, Nurture Shock, New Thinking About Children and the Dop. And she also wrote Top Dog, The Science of Winning and Losing. And this is going to be a fabulous episode. She really talks about these like parenting truths that go against the grain, against what we assume is natural or normal, right? And so she might surprise you with some things you kind of thought were one way, but maybe are another, right? And so she really loves to find this research that debunks conventionally held truths. So you're going to learn about the problem with praise and, you know, what are some of the best ways to actually respond to kids. And you're going to learn that, you know, kids who are overpraised underperform, how little kids lie, why they lie, right? Because they don't want to disappoint and how you can catch bad behavior from others. Oy vey, my goodness. <laughs> so this is a great episode, but I'm still like celebrating the whole 1 million downloads thing. Super psyched about it. So happy. So want to thank you. So want to celebrate. It's amazing. It's, uh, it's just so cool. So I love it. I love it. I love it. You know, to celebrate this, this is what we're going to do. We're going to do a book giveaway. And I'll give away a copy of Raising Good Humans. And what I want you to do is to share a screenshot of the Mindful Mama podcast, wherever you're listening to, share it on social media and tag me in the post. And we're going to keep track of all the people who share before the end of October. And we will do a giveaway for one lucky person who is sharing. And you can say that we've had a million downloads. So exciting. Celebrate with us and we'll do a book giveaway. Yay. All right. Now I got to tell my folks that I'm doing this thing. So (laughs) yes, let's celebrate it. And this is a great episode to share with people. It's so interesting talking to Ashley Merriman. I read her book in 2009 and was like, oh my goodness, it's really, really fascinating. So I can't wait to dive into this episode. Join me at the table as I talk to Ashley Merriman. Ashley, thanks so much for coming on the Mindful Mama podcast. I'm so glad you can be here. Thank you. I'm excited to actually learn learn for you. I don't know if mindful is how I would describe myself. So I'm excited (laughs) for the conversation. Well, you, 10 years ago, you co-wrote with Poe Bronson, Nurture Shock. And it was a pretty, a pretty groundbreaking book about parenting, I guess, so to speak. And in that you bring mm-hmm. incredible, you bring in, you talk about a lot of research that, I mean, for me, I can literally remember kind of like where I was talking about some of the ideas in your book. Like I remember like a specific path that I was on talking about some of the ideas in your book and just getting so excited about them. And there are all these ideas about parenting that are based on research that may be like non-intuitive, which I think is so interesting. And for me, what was particularly interesting, because it it brought 
it, it was so illuminating for me in my own journey was the research on praise. And I was like, oh my gosh, I was, you know, my parents like where they were of the generation where they praised me, they told me how creative I was and blah, blah, blah. And I'm a good student. I can do that thing. But am I only doing it for the grade like that? I, I, you, it, your book put me into a tailspin about that as I was like, my daughter was oh, no. <laughs> not a tailspin, but just really an interesting tailspin. My daughter's 13 okay. now. So and my daughter was three and all this stuff is happening. So anyway, tell us about, I'd love to hear maybe about the beginnings of the book a little bit, but uh, specifically about that praise research that was so unintuitive at the time. Um, yeah, well, if it is any consolation, I sort of had the same reaction you did to the science, <laughs> which is um, my friend Poe Bronson and I were writing an article for New York Magazine on the science of ambition. And we were interviewing all of these New York tycoons who were saying, you know, on a good day, I changed the skyline of New York. I mean, that was, that was their baseline for what was a good day. I was like, wow, I'm a freelance writer for a good day. I get out of bed. So <laughs> I was, you know, pretty impressed by this. But a lot of them were talking about how they had always beaten this ambition and always known for it. It seemed like it was in utero that they had been dec decreed a tycoon. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to know after a certain point of talking to all these people, if that was true. Was like, what were the things that parents or genetics or whatever it was, what was it that was giving these kids this path? And that made, and specifically about motivation. And so I started looking around for the science to see if there was anything relevant and didn't find anything about baby tycoons. <laughs> but I did find the research of Carol Dweck. Mm. And Carol was looking at the effects of praise on kids and telling the difference between telling a kid, you're so smart and you worked hard at that. And what she found was that kids who were told, you're so smart, we had this idea that if we built their self-esteem, if we told them they were wonderful, that they would perform because they weren't scared of it. They knew they were great, so they would just, you know, fearlessly pursue things. And what Carol found in experiments, which she did with hundreds of fifth graders, and then she replicated it with different age groups, and then they did experiments over about a 10-year period, was consistently kids who were overpraised and told they were smart actually underperformed. They took the easier test when they're given an opportunity to challenge themselves. They took the easy road out. Um, some of them, when asked if you would do it again, said that they would lie and cheat. Because if you cheat and you do it badly, it doesn't reflect on your ability. It's that other kid, well, I could have done it if I wanted to. I just didn't care enough. Mm. So, so if I cheated, it's because that guy's an idiot, not me. Mm -hmm. And so they actually became overly invested in this nomenclature of smart and didn't want to do anything to jeopardize it. And they were worried they couldn't live up to their own reputation. Mm. Whereas the kids who had, who had been told you worked hard at that. And again, this is, we've got longitudinal data. We've got lab experiments within five minutes, literally one sentence of praise and everything in between. And the kids who were told versions of you worked hard on that were taught that success is based on their involvement. And can they decide to do something? And is it important enough to do them? And to work hard becomes the challenge and the excitement. And you don't have to prove to yourself you work hard. You just actually have to experience it. And it's interesting because the U.S. American parenting culture is obsessed with smarts. You know, we want gifted children. We want special children, blah, 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 blah. In Asia, the cultural reference is actually on effort. Mm -hmm. And researchers there found the almost opposite pattern because kids were like, I don't know. I just can't work as hard. I'm just, that's just not in my genes. I can't do it. And they would <laughs> give up. Oh, no. Because the, the, so it's not this magical say they're smart or say they they work hard. Mm -hmm. It's this idea that that success is something that they can control and that they can work on. If you constantly say you have to work harder, work harder, work harder, work harder, to the point where the kid feels like, 
how hard I work is no longer up to me, it's my physical stamina, mm -hmm. then they're going to give up. But it's really about focus on the process. Mm. You know, once I was talking to Carol and she was talking about how if a kid walked, you know, through a baseball in the house and broke a vase or a dish or something, I don't think there'd be any parent who think it was good parenting to say, you terrible child. <laughs> and say, you did a stupid thing. We wouldn't even say you stupid child. We'd say, you did a stupid thing. I've told you before, don't throw the ball in the house. But we would focus on that. But if that same kid came home from art class and said, look, mommy, I made a plate. Look, mommy, I made a vase. Oh, that's amazing. You are so talented. Mm -hmm. No, they're not. They made a plate. Mm -hmm. So the same overstatement and overinflation of the badness, for lack of a better word, we think isn't so great, but we flip it around and think it's okay and the positives and the research says no. Both of them focus on the thing they did and not who they are. Because so they can change what they do. They can't change who they are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's this like kind of judgmental statement kind of about about who they are, how, who you are that is problematic. It, and, well, the, it and the sort, sort of, of overstatement of piece is like, I mean, I, I, kids have incredible BS meters. They know that they're not always whatever this incredible thing is that you're saying to them, I guess. Well, actually, at the up until the age of seven, kids take praise, um, fa praise at face value. Mm -hmm. But at, by 12, studies have shown that they've heard so much false praise. Mm -hmm. They actually start thinking that hearing praise is a sign that they're doing badly. Oh, wow. Because if you think about what praise is supposed to be, it's supposed to be recognition for something you did well. But we don't use it for that. We use it to encourage. That was so great. Do it again. You can do even better next time. If I have to do even better next time, it probably wasn't so great, was it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so the studies showed that these 12-year-olds knew that when someone was saying, oh, you're really good at this, keep going, that it was actually a sign that people were worried about them. If they had been doing fine, they would have just left them alone and not said a thing. Mm. So, so is this really, an, is this, do you see this, invita do you see this research as an invitation for parents to back off a little bit in general? Cause I mean, I remember hearing this and, you know, and uh, at the time and kind of still it's like, good job, good job is like rampant, like good job is so, you know, everywhere. But so is it, is this an encouragement for parents to just let kids own their own experiences a little bit more? Well, good job is actually encouragement, not praise. Mm, okay. Great. Right. And it's so vague, it's not helpful. Yeah. <laughs> what did I do that was so great? How I can't replicate it. I can't learn from that. It's just cheering. It's woohoo. Yeah. Right. And, and pe a lot of people don't think of it that way. They just think good job and it's not helpful. And what we want is help. And mm. actually, to your point, we don't have to recognize every single thing a child did as praiseworthy. We don't have to recognize everything a child did is worthy of condemnation. And um, actually, another one of the things I, you know, one of those quick off the, com off the top of your head sentences that changes your life, another one that Carol gave me was, you know, sometimes the best praise is, how do you think you did? Mm. Right? Mm -hmm. and, and there was no judgment. It wasn't, oh, really? How do you think you did? It was sincerely asking. Tell me how you think you did. Mm. Because what we want is kids to develop a sense of knowing when they've done their best, when they need help, when they're struggling. And if we're constantly praising them and giving them insincere praise, we're robbing them of that ability to ask for help. And there was another researcher we wrote about, um, Alina Bozrova, who was talking about you know, the difference between an A and a B and a C student. And an A student, you say, hey, honey, how'd you do in that quiz? Oh, I did okay. I think I missed question number three and number four. Um, the rest of them, I'm pretty sure I got a complete, you know, I got those right. And your C student, your D student, hey, honey, how'd you do? Oh, I don't know. They literally, they could have gotten 100%. They're going to get zero. They literally don't know. 
they haven't developed that sense of gauging their ability. And that means they don't know if they need to ask for help, if they need to reread that chapter, study more, because they're not sure if they got it or not. And they're waiting for that quiz to tell them. They're waiting for other people to rate their own performance. And what we want for kids and for adults is for them to be able to rate themselves. This is so interesting because I can see a complete parallel here with when my daughters were little climbing trees and they would climb trees and I, and, and, you know, I'd say, you know, if they got nervous, I'd say, well, how do you feel? How does it feel in your body to be there? Does that feel like a good choice to go higher or does that feel not? And sometimes I would say, hey, well, I feel really nervous about you going that a little higher and I'm going to be here spotting you. But, but I would ask them to gauge it in themselves. And they're incredibly tree climbers. I do have to brag that little bit about my children. But, you know, I mean, it's a, it's a very similar thing. And we're asking that we're, you're, what you're saying is this question is like developing that self-awareness, that self-understanding, have, developing that internal intrinsic knowledge rather than relying on extrinsic Yes. Uh, And it's based on self-efficacy, which is about skill acquiring, skill building, rather than that innate, I'm good at something I'm not, I'm talented, I'm not, I'm special, I'm not. Right. Mm. Um, If if that's your, you know, Carol Dweck talks about it famously is the fixed mindset, which Mm. is you're good at something or you're not. Whereas the growth mindset is about focusing on progress and improvement. And so, yeah, that's, that's really what we want for praise and for really any feedback is specific things that relate to process because you can improve your process you can change your process but you don't want to force feed someone all the time to let and you want to give them the opportunity to see if they can figure out where the process is weak and that they need help and that's true just as much for adults at work as it is for a three or four year old trying to learn how to read yeah, these are universal. I, all the, all the best things in, in this way are often universal. And you mentioned before we began that you're do, you're doing work also. In, this is aside from nurture shark, but with the social cognition of good and bad behavior. And it sounds like this is something that relates very well to what we were speaking about. So, can you tell me a little bit more about that? Well, yeah, and also that these are social contagions as well, right? That you can catch bad behavior from others <laughs> and, we, and we do and we do and and but then the interesting question is well when and why do you catch bad behavior and what are the limits of good and bad behavior um, and this does sort of fit into that self-image that we were talking about with praise and the research seems to show like zoe chance and dan Ariely and other people have looked at bad behavior and have found that we all accept that we kind of do an occasional bad thing, but it, that was a mistake. It wasn't on purpose. I had an off day, but I'm not a bad person. Mm-hmm. And we often, if we do one bad thing, we'll do something else that we think is good to sort of you know, do this karmic cancel out. <laughs> right? we're, we're at least even or maybe a little bit better. Guilty. <laughs> well, we all do it. It's human nature because what we wanted to do is we want to reaffirm that self-image of ourselves as being good people. So one of Dana Ariely's, my favorite experiments, um, and this has nothing to do with the fact that I'm an addict of Diet Coke, um, but he would go to colleges and, you know, there'd be like just a sort of communal fridge that everybody kept things in on the floor of a dorm or a lab or something like that. And he would put a six pack of Diet Coke and then they would time how long it took before people stole all the Diet Cokes. (laughs) <laughs> and then he would go to the same refrigerator and he would take a little plate and he would put six bucks, six dollars in cash on the plate and wait to see how long it took. Nobody took the money. Huh. Because Diet Coke's, yeah, you know, I'm sure he was thirsty. You know, it's like, but cash was stealing. Uh, yeah, I could see that. I could see because we do generally share our drinks and we don't generally hand out our dollar bills, I suppose. But you didn't ask anyone for permission to get a code. You just took it. And it cost the same amount of money. It's a yeah, dollar exactly. or a dollar. But it didn't seem as concrete and real in yeah. terms of the stealing idea. So it gave us just enough bit of the comfort that we could go in there. Um, but then another one of Dan's great experiments, he would have college students 
um, at Carnegie Mellon um, would be taking a quiz and you know it was a psychology experiment and everybody was told you know do this and then take money you know give it you know turn in your scores it's honor system and take the money that we're paying you for the experiment and one of the students who's a confederate obviously uh, would go up and go well this is stupid i'm just gonna say i did it and take the money and when that happened more students followed their lead and were like, oh yeah, yeah, that's that makes sense. Yeah, let's just all take the money. Mm. They won't know. But if they put the student in a pit sweatshirt, which is the arch rival of the schools, huh. nobody else did it. Huh. Because that was, well, you know, we're better than that school. It's like an so in-group was, outgroup thing, huh? Yeah, well, it was an in-group outgroup, but it was in that in-group defining who we are. Mm, yeah, and if you have this sense that you're an innately good person, you might give yourself a little fudge room, but you're not to the point where you have to redefine yourself. Mm. So if um, you see someone that you sort of relate to kind of breaking, breaking the rule, doing a bad behavior, that's, uh, uh, you know, depending, I guess, depending on the scale, mm -hmm. it's this, is this social permission. Like we do, we don't, mm -hmm. we think of ourselves as so individual, I guess, but it's that, that that like our you know everyone else is doing it we'll do mm -hmm. it too basically huh a hundred percent um and bad behavior is more contagious than good behavior unfortunately um but you know they've done studies of twitter and tweets that are negative are faster to be republished and tweeted and responded to and the people respond to that tweet in an equally or more negative fashion than the tweet that they read oh my so we're sort of you know constantly raising ratcheting things up um so yeah and one of my favorite of the studies and um it wasn't exactly priuses although i think they replicated it with um, green cars uh, but they found the people who had been like thought of themselves as doing something pro-environmental were more likely to cheat on a test in in lab experiments you know if you think wow that person you know in the, the nice e car cut me off it's because they may actually think by the virtue of being in this car, I'm constantly reminded that I'm saving the environment and I'm such a good person that I can just totally, you know, switch lanes, not use my blinker and speed along because the rest of it's all canceled out. So social context in terms of the environment, but then examples of other people are really important. Watching someone on television blame a politician for something that they did makes you more likely to blame someone else for something you did. I mean, it's instantaneous. We're just monkey see, monkey do. Yeah, well, a lot of it. And um, well, it makes a know, big argument for. It makes a big argument for our, at least in parenting, like it makes a big argument for modeling in a huge, you know, I mean, modeling is of course the, the most powerful thing in general, but it's 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 research that's showing, showing that in, in a larger context in a way. Modeling is incredibly important, but for parents who are teaching the behavior, you have to do both. You have to do it and you have to explain why you did it. Mm. Because the kid may not see the whole of the event or may just not understand the context. You have a very specific reason why you did something. But if you haven't shared that, they're not necessarily going to know that. And that, again, works in the good, bad behavior. Um, I, I, like um, white lies. And, and lies. Well, mommy, you told me lies are wrong. So why did you tell grandma that we were, that we love the sweater? Cause we hated the sweater. <laughs> that was a lie. Lies are bad. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, but we intended to do the right thing. We don't want to hurt grandma's feelings. Well, I, you told me no one, no, you told me no lies. So we really have to be, co you know, cognizant of the disconnects of what we're telling kids and what we're acting out because they do absolutely see the modeling, but they can't necessarily automatically figure out why you may be acting in a way that's inconsistent with what you said or that they can't just attribute, you know, some specific intent to w watching you do something. So we've kind of got to narrate our decision making for them to make sure they get mm -hmm. it. Stay tuned for more Mindful Mama podcasts right after this break. 
So the other day I had the amazing pleasure of taking this adorable little box from my mailbox and walking it over to my BFF friend and neighbor's mailbox and give this little box to her first grader, Everett. And I was giving Everett his first pair of pear eyewear glasses. And oh my goodness, was he so psyched. I have to tell you why, because it's really, really different what you get with pear eyewear. So pear eyewear is the first direct-to-consumer, customizable children's eyewear brand reimagining the glasses experience for kids, allowing children to quickly and easily customize the look of their glasses anytime, anywhere. So this is how this works. It's so cool. So Everett got these super cool pair of clear prescription lenses, and he got these two pieces that go on the front so he could customize them. And one was red with little paper airplanes on them and the other one was green all kinds of like sports gear and stuff like that he was so psyched and so happy that he could change his glasses depending on what he was wearing for a boy to be able to pick this accessory it was so cool like doesn't normally get to do that it was really really cool for him when building pair co-founders nathan and sophia spoke to over 500 families and discovered how dissatisfied kids and parents were with the overall glasses experience when the talking to children they made the simple observation why do we get to change our clothes while our glasses remain the same day after day that's how Everett felt and so from this pear was born and it is the ultimate choice really for parents and children looking to take care of their eyes while still looking fashionable and they even just released a collaboration with marvel featuring tons of superhero designs like spider-man and captain america for nba fans they have team designs too when for your little fashionista, they have this whole tie-dye collection is so cute. Pear offers blue light sunglasses and prescription lenses and delivers their glasses to families with an engaging digital experience. Honestly, Everett had so much fun picking them for just $60 per pair, well below the $300 average price point for a pair of kids' prescription glasses. Get your first pair for $48 when you use the code hunter on paireyewear.com. That's P-A-I-R eyewear.com. Coupon code hunter to get your first pair for just 48 bucks. Yeah, yeah. I, I talk about that with parents when we talk about taking care of your stress response and taking care of your difficult feelings. Like mm -hmm. say what you're doing. I'm taking a break because I'm feeling overwhelmed. I'm taking a, a break and I'm putting my hands on the ground here and taking some deep breaths because I can feel myself getting really frustrated, right? Like the, all that, it's that, you know, name it to tame it. It helps us to, helps us to, to really ground. And then you're, you're teaching your kids. It's, it's awesome. So you also talk I about- had I had this one favorite thing. I was, I was doing a lecture and a mom came up after me, afterwards to talk to me. And she's this statu statuesque, willowy figure with long brown hair. And she's wearing this perfectly tailored white suit. And I'm just in awe of this majestic <laughs> woman floating towards me. And, and I talk about how we have to be okay with kids making mistakes and have make sure that they learn from them. She said, okay, well, I understand what you said. Should I intentionally enroll my child in activities that I know that they will be bad at so that they can experience <laughs> failure? It's a good question. It's a good question. I'm, I'm sure people are wondering. She, and actually other people had asked me that question since. Yeah. And I said, no, they're kids. They're going to screw up no matter <laughs> what. You don't need to stage experiences of mistakes <laughs> and failure. They will find a way to do it on their own. They're kids. They're learning. That's what they do. Yeah. That's why they're kids. So you don't have to stage failure. What you have to do is you have to be okay when it happens. And, and you know, again, picturing this lovely woman in this lovely uh, white suit. Now I'm picturing, while well, I'm talking to her, that she's living in this, you know, all white mansion, you know, <laughs> just like the, the perfect everything model home kind of thing. I don't have no idea what her house looks like, but in my mind, that's what she, you know, the house goes with the suit. And, I said, yeah, so you also want to model that you're, you know, that mistakes are okay. Mm -hmm. It's not just telling them. Because if you think about it from the kid perspective, kids see 
grown-ups always have the answer. They always know what they're doing. They're always the ones in charge. And they never see you make a mistake. You may say, well, I make mistakes all the time at work or with my friends or whatever, but they don't see that. Hmm. So they don't see you laugh a mistake off or take it hard or work harder the next time or whatever. They just don't see that. They don't have experience with that. So, so ma'am, you know what? The next time you're home, and again, I'm picturing this all white mansion, like, so, you know, make spaghetti and just put the plate just a little bit too close to the edge of the oh, counter no. and when it falls <laughs> off, go, huh, well, look at me. I should really have been paid more attention to where I put that spaghetti. And the look on the woman's <laughs> face was abject horror. I she, she almost started shaking. And I was like, oh my God, she really is living in an all white perfect <laughs> And I was like, no, really. And she's like, and you could just tell there was no possible way she could do that. And I'm like, if you can't handle making mistakes, mm-hmm. yes, your kids are seeing that. I didn't say that to her. I just, you know, I was trying to be warm and supportive. But We've got to be okay with making mistakes and how we respond to them. And that includes modeling that, uh, sort of embracing it. What did I learn from it for our own mistakes? And if you're a perfect person in a perfect house, then stage a mistake for you, not for the kid. Because <laughs> the kids will come up with them on their own. It's hard for, uh, I have a lot of clients like who are raised with that, you know, women, girls are raised with that perfectionist thing. Like mm-hmm. you have to be perfect. You have to always do the right thing and and, uh, and always say the right thing and look good doing it. And there's incredible mm-hmm. pressure out there um, to do that. So it, it really is a big ask in a lot of ways to say, and- Mm-hmm. To, to admit your mistakes, to to say to your kids, I messed up and I'm sorry. Like that's, it's, it's amazing how hard it is for, for us as parents to do that, you know? Well, if you think about, and I 100% agree with everything you said in terms of that concept of kids or women or girls need to be perfect. How far is that from what we're, where we started with phrase and that you need to focus on what you do and not who you are? Mm -hmm. If who you are is perfection, only God is perfect. Mm -hmm. So you're kind of doomed. And if you're an atheist or an agnostic, you don't even have God to say he's perfect. (laughs) You're just just screwed, right? So (laughs) apologies to the plain flip. But I mean, seriously, like humans are not perfect. And if that is our standard, we are at a certain point loading ourselves up for failure and it's then again how are you responding to failure and if you've been i can't fail but you ultimately will because you're not perfect I mean, there's a whole line of literature on perfectionism and how yeah. destructive it is and perfectionist strivings striving to do better and to use that to motivate you that's productive because that's pushing you but when the goal is being perfect when it's a perfectionist goal rather than that striving, it's really unhealthy. It's, um, it's like never good enough. That's basically what perfect is. It's never, nothing literally, is never good enough. Literally. literally. Yeah. And often, I mean, there's actually, a, well, I, you probably have other questions and you're not interested in getting all excited and geek out. Uh, <laughs> but there's different kinds of perfectionism. There's perfection in terms of what I expect from, my spell, what I, from myself, um, what I think other people expect, expect from me. You know, if my mother expects me to be perfect, if the world expects me to be perfect and I know I'm not, that's a different kind of challenge than thinking I'm not living up to my own beliefs of what I can do. Mm. Um, Performative perfection is much more difficult and destructive than uh, than that wanting to do better, wanting to push yourself. Um, Mm. Can I talk about humility for a second? Oh, yes, please. Please do, Ashley. You're a fount of of interesting things. (laughs) Well, I think this, it, this, to me, all of these fit in my head. Um, there, I'm a lawyer, and in law school, you're always taught that the law is a seamless web. Pull out one place, and the whole other thing shrinks or stretches. And, and I kind of feel like praise and self-efficacy and perfectionism, these, these are all a big web in my head. It's actually, just means there's cobwebs in my head. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well. Not much you can do with that. Too much um, Diet Coke. <laughs> Never. 
<laughs> never too much diet coke um so what i love about the science of humility is there is an actual science of humility and the scientific definition has three parts ready because mm -hmm. each part's really important i swear an accurate view of your strengths and weaknesses in the context of the whole. Okay. Now, we're going to start with, it has to be accurate. Mm -hmm. So it's not your inflated praise. Mom always thought I was wonderful. I must be wonderful. Um, mom says I'm a genius, so I must be a genius. <laughs> well, let's actually look at your grades. Let's compare your grades to your peers' grades. Yeah, let's get some evidence that you're brilliant. So it has to be accurate. Strengths. What are you good at? What you're really good at. And if you know what you're really good at, what are you going to do with it? How do you contribute? How do you use this? Now we've started, and, and it's accurate. So this isn't arrogance. The whole point of this is humility, right? It's an accurate perception of, I'm really good at blank. Mm -hmm. Okay, next part, weaknesses. Mm -hmm. I'm not using the weaknesses assessment as my starting point to prove that I am unworthy. It's about saying, okay, well, I'm good at this, but I'm really not good at that other thing. <laughs> and again, it's accurate. So you're not exaggerating your badness or, or your goodness, like we talked before with the false praise. It's really, you know, am I, okay, well, I'm contributing what my strengths are. Now I've identified my weaknesses. How do I work on that? Mm -hmm. I'm sure the I listener and just like me are like the, your strengths and weaknesses are like going through your head. All of this, yeah, yeah, plus, yeah. You know, like I'm, I'm good at. I love doing a podcast. I'm good at doing a podcast. Is great. It's fine. I'm so like not good at administrative and organizational pieces. It's so funny. Okay, you know, it's well, really interesting. I have a very clear picture of that, and once had an assessment that like really showed how how. Okay, well now we're going to <laughs> we're, now we're going to get to the next part, which is. Now you've realized you can identify this part where you can grow and develop your skills, or you can realize that that's not really that important to mm -hmm. you. So now you need to hire, you need to expand your team mm -hmm. and recognize that those are other people's strengths and be grateful for them rather than jealous or, di or diminish their achievement or accomplishment. Say, wow, you did something that I just totally cannot do. That's fantastic. Either teach me or please do this and I'm good at this. Let's trade. Mm -hmm. And then the last part is in the context of the whole. Mm -hmm. Now, there are um, atheistic versions of the humility research. There are theistic versions so some people will talk about it in terms of god some people will talk about it in terms of visiting the grand canyon or looking at the stars in the sky or history and is what you did that important in this bigger context mm. now i still think you can actually and sometimes do it in a smaller context right? Michael Jordan may be an incredible basketball player to this day, but if he's the only person on the court, he's going to have a really hard time passing because mm -hmm. there's no one else to catch the ball, right? Um, I hear he needs a little humility from the people who've watched the <laughs> 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 yeah, well, well, but that's kind of interesting, right? Because if I walked up to Michael Jordan and I said, you're one of the best basketball players ever, and he went, no, nah, not really. That's not humble. No, that's false humility. It's, it, it's, 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 fa it's false modesty. Uh, yeah. And the difference between modesty and humility is modesty is what we show other people. Mm. Humility is what we think of ourselves. Mm, okay. Mm -hmm. So if Michael Jordan were to say, yeah, I know what everybody else sucks. I'm the best ever. And I've changed the world and the world will never be the same because of me. Well, maybe he's got some evidence about that in terms of influence on culture. Um, on the other hand, I'm sure people in Pompeii thought they were changing the world too, and that didn't do very much for them, right? So if we look at a bigger picture from history, the humble response would be, thank you. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. Not pretending he's good or pretending he's bad, but recognizing where he is and his strengths and weaknesses in the context of the whole. Mm -hmm. And 
that I use that actually going back to what you were saying about the the podcast and the admin, I tend, I'm in the perfectionist category. I am very high standards. I am merciless to myself when I make a mistake, which is pretty much on the app. And I use the humility research to be a, an actual checklist. Okay. I frequently, because I'm typing too fast and then I'm editing emails and I edit and it takes me an hour to write a two sentence email because I'm a writer. So it has to be perfect, but I've edited it so many times by at the time I actually give up and send click, I've left out a word or it's half of the half of one draft of the sentence and half of the other. I regularly do this. And then I beat myself up about it. Oh my God, I can't believe that. That person thinks I'm an idiot. I am the worst. Really? Yes. Yeah, am I a worst? <laughs> no, I mean, like, really, like, yeah. I, I, you know, and I can get down on myself on this. I'm like, okay, accurate view of your strengths and weaknesses in the context of the whole. Did your typo mean the person who can't, who got it, doesn't understand what you wrote? Or actually, you know, you meant do not do something and you said do it and you forgot that, okay, then you got to fix it. But does that negate the relationship I have with that person? Does it negate the work that I have done in the rest of my life? Because I sent a typo and I think probably not. Yeah. So it's very much like Kristen it. Neff's work on, on, self-compassion, which is looking at your things and seeing your common humanity, right? In the context of the whole is very similar to that, like yeah, kind of taking I, that I try, perspective. I, I try and be, I, I like the humility research on it because it just seems very specific and actionable. I'm always looking for the research that I can implement, even if it sounds really great, but I can't figure out how to do it. I'm constantly saying at least 10 times a day, um, you got to idiot proof this. I'm being the idiot and, and I like humility in that it, it is that actual checklist. I can say, did I do this? Did I do not do they this? Mm -hmm. And, and I feel like not, I'm obviously really interested in the self-compassion research, but I haven't, again, my own deficit, haven't figured out how way, a way to implement it in the same way beyond saying, well, I should be nicer to myself. Mm. Um, I should understand that I make mistakes. I should, but I don't. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I guess for me, sometimes I think like, okay, like there's like seven, eight billion people in the world. Like at this time, literally there are a million other people feeling whatever I'm feeling right now in a very similar way. And like in a very, for me, that that's a way that I can say, okay, I am so not alone in this. This is not just me. You know, this is a, this is a whole thing, but I love this. I love this humility research. This is so cool. You know, like let us be accurate and that requires some mindfulness, like some clear mm -hmm. seeing about ourselves and Absolutely. you know, we can either grow or compensate and, and just like think about this big picture, step back into this, into this perspective. Maybe, you can give us some of this perspective that I think is really needed. Um, I really would love to bring in uh, a little bit about the why kids lie because parents, it, it's so um, frustrating. So, so frustrating when they lie. Why are <laughs> they lying? What's going on? And, and you talk about that in Nurture Shock. So I was wondering if you would mind mm -hmm. talking a little bit to that as well. Well, I mentioned actually a little bit of it before, and it relates to that preservation of self-image. Mm. You know, some of it kind of depends on how old the kid is, right? About 96% of children, if you ask them if lying is wrong, will tell you, yes, it's wrong. I said, well, why is it wrong? Um, for little kids, the reason it's wrong is because it gets you in trouble mm. and because it gets you punished. Um, but when you ask a little kid, you know, why did you lie? It's because they don't want to disappoint mommy and daddy. Mommy and daddy said I'm a good little girl and a good little boy. I don't want to prove them wrong. Yeah. And uh, Bella DiPaolo did this wonderful research where she, um, and she titled the story or the, the journal article, Serious Lies. And she had a tape recorder in a room and she had community members just go in and tell the biggest lie they've ever told. And oh. no one, and they didn't write in their names. They didn't say who they were. They just literally walked in, told the lie, and then left. 
no way to track them, no way to hold anybody accountable. And, you know, she was hearing, you know, used car salesmen talk about how they had taken clients and people were telling about affairs and um, someone even confessed to a murder. Wow. But there was a number enough that this became an actual separate category in her analysis of people who said, as adults, when I was eight, I um, scratched my mom's, my mom's dresser drawer, but I knew mom would know that it was me. So instead of me, I scratched my sister's initials instead of mine. And another, someone else said, well, um, it was my birthday and I really wanted the frosting. So I took a big hunk of the frosting and I ate it before I was supposed to. And then I told my mommy that, the, that it came that way from the store. And she kept saying, really? This is it? This is the biggest lie you got? <laughs> and she, she was. She was like, I have a grant here. I have to actually publish. This, what kind of nonsense is this? <laughs> and then she started realizing, because there were more and more of these stories kept coming. And she said, that was the moment when they lied. And it changed their self-image where they thought they were really did think they were little girls and little, little good girls and little good boys. And they did something that was wrong and they got away with it and went, Oh, that was very powerful. I can get away with so many things. What else can I get away with? Or they didn't get away with it and they got caught and their parents were disappointed with them. And they're like, and they never lied again. Because it, it, it rattled their sense of who they were and what they can do. Um, so I think, you know, that's, you know, how we respond to kids' lies is really important in that way. Now, not all lies are obviously that grave. Uh, there's a whole separate um, a category of lies, especially for little kids, um, where they're really just playing. You know, Mommy, there's somebody at the door. There's nobody at the door. Um, they are not trying to actually make lie so that you burn dinner. They're trying to invite you to play for imagination. Mm. They want you to, you know, have someone come in and, you know, have a party with. Um, so there are different motivations to lying, uh, but mostly they just don't want to disappoint you. And that actually is really the same at its core when you look at, you know, teenagers. Why did you lie? Most teenagers don't do a bold face lie. Mm -hmm. They just omit the facts. Well, I did go to the library. I neglected to mention that I stopped at my friend's house when, when she was having a kegger, but I did go to the library. Mm -hmm. um, and they say it's because they don't want to disappoint their parent. Mm. So how do we, how, what's the best way for us to respond to this? I mean, I guess we want to say, reassure them that we won't be disappointed and, but what if we are really disappointed? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's important to Kids remember are actually us. that, and how we, res they'll, they'll tell you about a small misdeed to see how you react. And then they'll tell you about the bad one. So if you flip out over, you know, a bad grade, you are never going to understand why there's a new dent in that car. Mm. Right. So they are gauging what you're doing. And one of the important other things to keep in mind is, you know, usually a kid is lying to cover up something they did. So that's actually two issues. There's the underlying thing they did. We talked earlier about the kid throwing the ball in the house. Not did brushing you? teeth. That's the thing for me. <laughs> Okay, well, but it was like, well, the ball one is easier. The, the brush okay, one's a okay, little bit harder, we'll but we'll, we'll get there in a second. We'll go the ball. Um, okay, so there's a giant base, there's a softball that came through the window on the couch and there's glass everywhere. Do you know who threw the softball? No. Well, everybody in the room, the kid knows they threw it and you knew they threw it. You invited them to lie. Uh, mm -hmm. You set them up mm -hmm. and then you get mad at them for lying. Well, what were mm -hmm. they supposed to do? Mm. Right? What mm -hmm. did you expect them to say? They're, you know, if you, your kid's George Washington with a cherry tree, that's awesome, but most of us are not. Most of us. <laughs> so skip the lying part and say, you know, 
I, I know you were throwing in the balls in the back. You got to be more careful. We don't want to give people to get hurt. So mm. that's the other thing is we get upset and then we lie about, and then, or then we argue with the kids about the lying. But how do we differentiate the response to the lie and the response to the thing they are lying about? Mm. And if you said, okay, you lied and you threw the ball and you broke the window. So no Xbox for you for a month. Ask the kid, is it 15 days for the broken window and 15 days for the lie? Or did I get more punishment for the broken window and no punishment for the lie? They don't know. So there are sometimes you have to so say, the research says that you need to tell kids that it's important to tell the truth. Don't mm -hmm. dare them to lie. Say, I just want you to tell me the truth. I won't punish you if you tell me the truth. That's how important I think telling me the truth is. Mm -hmm. We can always fix the window. What we can't fix is if you don't trust me and I don't trust you. Mm -hmm. We have to trust each other. So promise them that you're not going to punish the truth. Ask them to promise to tell you the truth. And when they tell you the truth, you can't punish them. Mm -hmm. Because if you do, then you lied. Yeah, you lied. Mm -hmm. And, but then you have at least trust in your child. And that's yeah. the most important thing, obviously. And, and hopefully the next time they do something wrong, they'll come up to you and say, Mom, I need help. Mm -hmm. I did something wrong. Or I might do something wrong, and I'm not sure how to do this. Because they're going to do mm -hmm. wrong things. They're going to make mistakes. They're going to do we all discussed, that stuff. We, they, they are human. Make, yes. They're kids. They're going to make mistakes. Grown-ups make mistakes. Kids can make more of them. All right. And what we want to do is have them ask for help rather than pretend that everything is great so we don't catch them because mm. we can't help them we don't know it all right what about not brushing the teeth though well i was <laughs> the reason i said the brushing the teeth one is because it's the um because the ball and glass was easier to see yeah. and you know unless you're like you know touching the bristles to find out you know when they were wet <laughs> oh. <laughs> it's a little for me to tell you that you know that they lied, right? I know. But if you know they lied, then skip the setup for the lie. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Say you have to brush your teeth. Promise to tell me when you did. Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, that's... And it's... it's and and what you're talking about... Don't is, leave them. Then you got, you're prioritizing the relationship ultimately first. And that's really... Yes. what we want right like for any kind of to to be parent skillfully out of influence versus power right we want to be we have to prioritize that relationship they have to care about your relationship with you in mm -hmm. order to in order to want to um want to do good uh, because of that caring right and how old is this non-brushing your teeth kid <laughs> <Ten>. potentially <laughs> she might be 10 <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, if that, oh, that's old enough, then this should work for the brushing the teeth part, which is when you say, it's your responsibility to brush your teeth. And it's your responsibility, you know, it's one of those things that you have to do to take care of yourself when you're growing up. Mm -hmm. And when you do things that to control yourself, if I, I nag you, I'm treating you like a little girl. And I know you're growing up. Mm hmm so you give them the opportunity to say that I, I am taking care of myself. I am responsible for myself. And you have to then trust them to make that right decision. Yeah. And I mean, I think that's important. You know, there's a researcher, Nancy Darling and Judy Smetana look at, you know, teens and autonomy and the need for autonomy peaks at around 13 to 15. Mm. It's higher in an 11 and 12 year old than it is in an 18 year old. And I think about my, my friends who are parents whose kids have had knockdown drag out fights over whether you're wearing this t-shirt to grandma's house or that t-shirt to grandma's house. Well, I remind them they probably bought both t-shirts, right? So neither of the t-shirts are probably really that objectionable, but they want to make sure their kid looks nice for grandma. But it's that they're afraid that their kid is going to make the wrong decision. And they might even find themselves saying, why are we arguing over something so stupid as which t-shirt? And why is this so important to me? Well, we know because mom, we want to press mom. But why is it so important to the kid? 
because that's all they've got. Mm-hmm. You as an adult can decide who you have relationships with. Will you work? Will you not work? Where will you live? Where, what will you study? Who will you associate with? Will you be married? Will you be single? Whatever. What's an eight or 12 year old got? Yeah. Which t shirt I wear? Do I do my homework before or after I have, have dinner? Mm-hmm. These small decisions. And that and they're trying to get a sense of ownership of their lives and their and a real sense of autonomy. And but they can't, you know, the 18-year-old needs less autonomy because they have it by 18. Yeah. By 18, they may have a driver's license, they may have a job, they may have college or career plans. Your exactly. eight-year-old's got nothing and they don't see the change. So giving kids the opportunity and, the, and feeling that they're responsible for something and that people are counting on them to execute it is really powerful because they don't have that in other places. You know, so the, for the really little kid who's going to the, you know, doesn't want to go to bed on time, uh, uh, I mentioned the researcher, Elena Bodrova, she said, you know, okay, buy a second alarm clock. And you put the alarm clock in the family room and that clock, you have that child set the time and the time you set is when it's time to go brush your teeth and get ready for bed. Mm-hmm. And when it goes off, don't argue about me. It's time to bed. You're the one who set the clock. <laughs> yeah. Just, you're, you're the one who knows. So it's about giving them that self of sense ownership rather than just mommy says that daddy says that I have to do what they say. It goes to that unthinking and again, we want them to develop it. It's not just, did you brush your teeth? It's, did you brush your teeth well enough? Mm-hmm. Right? Because, you know, I, you know I, I wet the brush and I put the, <laughs> and it was done. <laughs> well, no, 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 you're going to have to send it back and do it. So, you know, maybe one day they wake up and go, ooh, I really, my mommy, my mom and my friends say, well, you probably should get brush your bed before you went to bed, right? So they may have to learn from a mistake or two. Um, I wouldn't let it go so bad that you need to, have lots of cavities, but giving them that little ability to take ownership in their tasks is important. And, you know, again, we talked before about narrating and modeling, you know, your 10 year old's old enough. I think you can say, Hey, I want to give you responsibilities around the house. I want you to be able to trust yourself to do that. But to do that, you have to earn them and to earn them you take responsibility for little things and the better you do on those, the bigger the responsibility you get. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Maybe. Well, yes, (laughs) yes, yes. I've done my standard. I'm not a therapist. No, no, I am. um, (laughs) I don't know your children. So I always hate giving advice to people. I don't know. I appreciate that advice. And I'm uh, I'm nodding because I agree so thoroughly. I'm a a Montessori parent. (laughs) And so there's a lot of responsibility given at all the mm-hmm. ages. Like here, you you take this responsibility and they do take a lot of responsibility and mm-hmm. they take some of it really well and some of it, yeah. And so, <laughs> you know, they're kids. Um, but um, Grown up yeah, no, I, I agree with everything <laughs> you're saying, Ashley, and I, I appreciate it enormously. There's so many things we didn't talk about. So dear listener, you if you had never read Nurture Shock. It is an important book to pick up. Um, there's so many, so much more in that also about, um, you know, how to talk about issues of race as well. And, and our TV, our, our good for you TV shows, are they good for, actually good for you? There's some really interesting stuff in there. And, um, and Ashley's also written about the science of winning and losing in a book called Top Dog. And I, I just want to thank you. I really appreciate the work you've done. I, I really appreciate you coming on the Mindful Mama podcast and sharing your, you're obviously so like passionate about like this incredible learning that you're, you're bringing out into the world in such a accessible way. Um, I really uh, appreciate it. And it was, it was, it, it brought so much to my life. So I, I personally thank, thank you. you as well. Uh, well, I feel like it, it's an honor to be able to tell scientists' findings to people who otherwise wouldn't have them. I mean, that's why scientists do the work. And so it's a big privilege to get to to talk about them to anybody and uh, delightful to get to share some of that with you today. So thank you. 
And and uh, we shouldn't neglect if you want like to reach out to Ashley and tell her how wonderful she is. Um, say good, good job, <laughs> yeah, Ashley. Yeah, my oh, brain's what? done. Over praise, false praise. I'm bringing it <laughs> <laughs> Where can they find you? <laughs> um, AshleyMerriman.com. And there, I'm also on Twitter and um, rarely on Facebook, um, but I'm pretty easy to find. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening. Wow. You know, it's so interesting, isn't it? The reasons, understanding the reasons why kids do the behaviors they do is so important, right? The why they lie. They just don't want to disappoint us. You know, it's such a a, a difficult thing, right? And we want to just be real with our kids. I think some of this goes back to that. And that's something we always talk about in mindful parenting is talking about being real, being authentic, and how when we communicate skillfully and authentically, honestly, that's actually the most effective way of responding. It's so interesting. We actually just recently distilled the mindful parenting method down into five steps, which I think is so cool. And it makes the acronym clear, which is so great. But uh, step one is to calm, calm your reactivity. And we do that with habits that study the heart, the mind, the nervous system, understanding our triggers and self-compassion. And then L, listen, listening reflectively, creating connection. E, express, expressing yourself honestly and effectively. And A, attend, be present. And R, resolve, resolving problems based on needs. So that is the mindful parenting clear method. So now, now you know, now you know. I hope you loved this episode. Oh, and we're doing that book giveaway. So help us celebrate the one going over a million downloads of the Mindful Mama podcast. Ah! Uh, just as, as a side note, this podcast started because way back in the first episodes, it was called Yoga Stories Project because I was going to teach a yoga class in 20, I think I started the podcast in 2014. And I was like, there's nothing to listen to where people are talking about the deeper philosophies and truths and enlightenment and things that I was interested in. And so I just started to make it right. Like people talking about these things because there weren't any podcasts like that at the time. And now it's morphed into this. And now we have over a million downloads. So you can help us celebrate that and win a copy of Raising Good Humans for yourself or a friend. All you have to do is take a screenshot of wherever you're listening. If you're listening on your phone now, just take a screenshot right now and then share it on Instagram or Facebook and tag me in that. On Instagram, I'm at Mindful Mama Mentor. Just say we're celebrating the 1 million downloads and share your favorite episode and help us celebrate. And before October 31st, 2020, we will do a giveaway and, and pick out one poster to get a copy of Raising Good Humans. And we can just celebrate together. Yay! So exciting. So I hope this was very helpful to you can't wait to see your takeaways and what it was. Uh, You know, you can always join us in our private Facebook community and you can learn more about that at mindfulmamamentor.com. But I'm excited to see you're celebrating. I want to see confetti emojis. Yay, so many confetti emojis. Woo. (laughs) All right. Uh, I can't wait to talk to you again next Tuesday. I will be back in your inbox. And thank you. Thank you so much for listening and celebrating with me. I'm wishing you peace and calm and all the things within that you want to give to your child because we cannot give what we do not have. All right. Thank you so, so much, my friend. Namaste. I'd say definitely do it. It's really helpful. It will change your relationship with your kids for the better. It will help you communicate better. And just, I'd say communicate better as a person, as a wife, as a spouse. It's been really a positive influence in our lives. So definitely do it. I'd say definitely do it. It's so worth it. The money really is inconsequential when you get so much benefit from being a better parent to your children and feeling like you're connecting more with them and not feeling like you're yelling all the time or you're like, why isn't things working? I would say definitely do it. It's so, so worth it. It'll change you. No matter what age someone's child is, it's a great opportunity for personal growth and it's a great investment in someone's family. I'm very thankful I have this. You can continue in your old habits that aren't working or you can learn some new tools and 
gain some perspective to shift everything in your parenting. Are you frustrated by parenting? Do you listen to the experts and try all the tips and strategies, but you're just not seeing the results that you want? Or are you lost as to where to start? Does it all seem so overwhelming with too much to learn? Are you yearning for a community of people who get it, who also don't want to threaten and punish to create cooperation? Hi, I'm Hunter Clark Fields, and if you answered yes to any of these questions, I want you to seriously consider the Mindful Parenting membership. You will be joining hundreds of members who have discovered the path of mindful parenting and now have confidence and clarity in their parenting. This isn't just another parenting class. This is an opportunity to really discover your unique, lasting relationship, not only with your children, but with yourself. It will translate into lasting, connected relationships, not only with your children, but your partner too. Let me change your life. Go to mindfulparentingcourse.com to add your name to the wait list so you will be the first to be notified when I open the membership for enrollment. I look forward to seeing you on the inside. mindfulparentingcourse.com